good yo people. Welcome to Let's Talk Yo-Yo. Today I'm gonna do the second part, part two of Yo-Yo Maker Pager Forms. On the first video of this, I've been reading this kid's book about the history and life of Pedro Flores. It also talks a little bit about the history of Yo-Yo in general. So it's got some good details in here in this book, even though it's a kid's book, and some things I'm learning. So Here's the second part. I think I'm gonna break it up into three parts. We left off last time talking about ancient Greece and where some of the origins of yo-yo uh, came from to where they weren't really much of a toy uh, to now where they are. And so we're in chapter five now and we're talking about the machine made marble. Here we go. By November, 1928, Flores had done what Haven and Hetrick couldn't do. He proved that the yo-yo could be popular in the United States. Investors took notice and helped finance the yo-yo manufacturing company. Flores used the money to buy machinery. His yo-yos were no longer hand-carved. They were factory-made. By March, the company had sold 100,000 yo-yos, but Flores wanted to offer his customers a wider selection. Around this time, he hired designer Dorothy Carter. Carter designed yo-yos that uh, appealed to many different customers. The simplest were sold for just under five cents. Others were fancier with silk strings. These cost as much as 150. That's a dollar 50. The yo-yo continued to rise in popularity. Over the next year, Flores expanded the company. He opened two new California factories. One was in Hollywood and the other was in LA. Between all three factories, Flores employed 600 people. Together, these workers produced 300,000 yo-yos each day. Chapter six, yo-yo contest craze. Flores now had powerful machinery and many hardworking employees. Producing many yo-yos was easier than ever, but there was still plenty of work to do. The yo-yo was a simple toy. What really amazed people was seeing it in action. Dropping a yo-yo so it spins back up was called throwing a yo-yo. Flores and his team knew that demonstrating yo-yos in public would boost sales, and they knew it, just the place to do it. They knew just the place to do it. Flores teamed with movie theaters to hold yo-yo contests. All these contests, company employees showed attendees how to use yo-yos. Then they sold yo-yos to interested viewers. They could sell hundreds of yo-yos at these events. At first, the yo-yo contest focused on endurance, Contestants competed to throw for the longest time. Eventually, the contest focused on more technique. Winners performed the most tricks without errors. Soon, other groups began holding yo-yo contests. By the end of 1929, newspapers across the country were calling the yo-yo the latest big fad. Chapter 7. The Duncan Era Flores's company became known for its quality toys. Flores knew his success would attract competitors. He wanted buyers to know, if it isn't Flores, it isn't a yo-yo. This was his slogan. So, on July 22nd, 1930, Flores trademarked his toy. Now, no one else could sell yo-yos under his name. Soon after, Flores teamed up with entrepreneur Donald F. Duncan. Duncan was an experienced businessman. He was very impressed with Flores' toy. He wanted to make the yo-yo even more successful. Meanwhile, Flores' passion had shifted. He was more interested in teaching children how to use yo-yos than in selling them. Flores' home life also changed around this time. In 1931, he married Edria Myers. The two were uh, together the rest of Flores' life. In 1929, Duncan bought Flores' company. It became the Duncan Toy Company. Flores continued to promote the company's yo-yos one of his greatest successes was the Duncan Toy Yo-Yo Team. Flores gathered a group of yo-yo throwers that included his childhood friend, Joseph Radovan. These throwers were Filipino immigrants, just like Flores. He had grown up playing with yo-yos. These throwers traveled the globe promoting Duncan toys. They performed yo-yo tricks outside of stores selling yo-yos. Passerby were amazed at their skills. The throwers then encouraged viewers to buy yo-yos of their own. Chapter 8. This will be the last chapter for today. All About It. 
Duncan wasted no time leading the company forward. Right away, he acquired the rights to the word yo-yo. Competitors now had to come up with new names for their toys. Duncan also released a new type of yo-yo, the O-Boy oh Yo-Yo Top. The O-Boy oh was similar to the Flores yo-yo. It was very popular. In 1931, the company sold 3 million in a single month. Yo-yo sales and continued to do well even when the U.S. economy entered a period of struggle. The Great Depression was a time in the 1930s when several nations' economies were poor. Few people had money to spare, but yo-yos were affordable for many people. The toy's popularity grew. Much of the yo-yo's success was due to Duncan's marketing skills. Duncan Toys teamed up with the Hearst newspaper chain. Hearst promoted Duncan's famous yo-yo contest in its papers. In return, contest entrants had to sell three newspaper subscriptions in order to compete. Hearst Papers also ran Duncan Toy ads. The ads featured eye-catching images and catchy phrases. All right, folks, that's going to do it for now. And there'll be one more part to the yo-yo maker Pedro Flores story. Until next time, good day and good yo-yo.